Okay, so next we talk about chip seek downstream analysis. It, the first thing, sorry, maybe we should just show you. Uh, the, the first thing is when we did the first, as I mentioned, uh, when I first came to Harvard, we were moving from yeast experiment now to human or mouse. Motif finding was impossible. It was just not working based on expression clusters. Uh, but then when we did the first chip chip, you know, was putting on an array, we found the motif right away. We're like really packing each other in the back. It was so much easier because basically you are just in reaching for the fragment that this transcription factor is binding to. And we could find it right away. And one thing people found was, uh, so later we also develop algorithm to improve this motif finding just for chip chip or chip seek experiment. We found, um, Usually when you have chip seek of say uh, 5,000 peaks, uh, we found that motif usually appear more frequently in those peaks that have stronger fold enrichment. For example, when you have a 50 fold chip seek peak, very often in that region, you not only have one copy of the motif, you might have three or five copies of the same motif. The motif redundancy actually allow the transcription factors to go to those cells more often, to, to those locations more often. And so you should be able to see that. And also, uh, because our peak is usually the peak we identified are a few hundred base pair long, but the peak summit will have more, you know, after you shift the reads, the peak summit will have uh, uh, more reads there. And that region also have more copies of this motif occurrence because that's where the transcription factor actually binds. And so there are motif finding algorithms uh, specifically developed to check if you have a chip seek data, whether the motif is enriched more in the peaks with higher fold change, or whether you have motifs that appear more in the middle or the summit of those peak locations. That's another way. Um, and also, if you are doing a transcription factor chip seek, um, and then you look for motif, you know, you got the motif you will know actually that most likely this chip seek has worked because that's why you use the antibody to enrich for this binding. And uh, if you were to look at some of the systrom data and look at the motif, you might see uh, this is one chip seek for this factor called NFE2. But when we look for motif, you can see the top motif. It's uh, NFE2L2, T, uh, yeah, TBX, uh, MAF, Jun, JunB, FOSL, BAC1, BAC2, NFE2 here, this is the transcription factor we actually uh, try to chip. But when you, try, when you look for motifs, all of these motifs, you, if you look at their pattern, they all pretty much look similar, similar to this. This is because um, the same trans, uh, sorry, the transcription fact, factors usually form families. So the different members of the same transcription fact, family member, you can see this is the family. Lucin zipper family. They are the same family of transcription factors. They very often have very, very similar motifs. Okay, and so um, sometimes when you do motif finding, you might be finding the correct motif that you are chipping, but also sometimes you will find the motif of another family member that's, that's, uh, that binds to a similar thing. Usually, uh, the different transcription factors, they may not all be highly expressed in the cell you are interested in. They, so for example, uh, the same family member, but some transcription factors are highly expressed in the brain, others are highly expressed in the muscle, others expressed in the blood, and so on. And so very often, uh, if you see these different motifs, you ask what other family members are here, the one that is highly expressed in your cell, those are the probably the real ones that binds to this motif in your cell. Okay, questions? Yeah, so motif finding for ChIP-seq, much, much easier. Um, but in addition to finding the main motif you're interested in, motif analysis you can use to find collaborating or interactions among different transcription factors. This is because in the chip seek experiment, remember the first thing you do is to cross-link. You use formaldehyde to make sure the transcription factor and the DNA have very, very stable interaction. In this step, not only you enrich, uh, you, you, you cross-link the protein to the DNA, if there are proteins that interact with each other, you will also cross-link the protein-protein interaction. 
to make them much more stable. And so supposedly you have this TF1 and the TF2 that are interacting with each other. And because they are transcription factors, they might be binding to different fragments that are really far away, or they might be binding to you know, adjacent sequence, different motifs that are adjacent to each other in the same peak. And so if you were to use the antibody uh, to enrich for the transcription factor of one, you will, in addition, pull down the, uh, pull down the DN DNA that's bound by the other transcription factor. Okay, and so one way to look at those uh, transcription factor interaction is, uh, actually this, this is only available recently. Um, in the Systrom DB, we also have a function called the Systrom Toolkit. If you have one transcription factor chip seek, you can run this against the Systrom Toolkit because we have collected the world's largest chip seek. In, you know, like you, you just run it. Um, and you ask what other transcription factors are also, you know, have significant overlap with my factor or, or with, with my chip seek data. Uh, for example, uh, this is one nanog chip seek data. And when you try to see what other data look similar to it, so here every dot is one public chip seek data. You can see there are a lot of other chip seek data on nanog that look like mine. And that's also an important quality control. If other people's nanog chip seek data look like yours, then yours probably worked, even if you're doing this in a different cell type. In addition, you can see uh, SOX2 also have very good uh, overlap. Uh, actually, if you keep looking there, you can also see uh, OCT4, which is of, uh, it's a different official name. In fact, if you were to look at this, you can tell what transcription factor interact with nanog. SOX2 and NANOG, it's very well known these two interact with each other in embryonic stem cells. Uh, Jet. So um, you say that like the, the peaks will overlap if the transcription factors interact. Could you not also get overlapping peaks if they competitively find the same spot? Ah. In the uh, yes, very good question. The question is uh, if transcription factor one and two interact or they collaborate, you will find their peaks overlap. But if two transcription factors compete to bind to the same location, yes, you will also see a significant overlap. But competing is, over, is also another way of interaction, right? Yeah, so basically, if you try to look for uh, other chip seek data with significant overlap of peaks with your chip seek data of interest, it can give you a lot of hints what other transcription factors might be important in either competing or collaborating with the factor you are interested in, okay? That's, that's uh, one thing. And the second is, if these two transcription factors interact, when you pull down by one antibody or the other antibody, you are likely to enrich for the binding side of the other. Therefore, when you do motif finding, not only you will see the TF1 motif enrichment, you will also see the TF2 motif enrichment. And, um, and, and that's uh, exactly what we did in actually the first uh, transcription factor chip, like chip seek data that was published uh, that we, we did early on. Um, yeah, so for example, uh, this is the uh, OCT4, sorry, nanog chip seek in here. When you look at the motif that's enriched, you see uh, nanog motif, you see the nanog motif here, you see the SOX motif. Remember in the previous slide, we did show that, you know, there is a significant overlap of nanog with SOX. And you do see that, see the SOX motif is enriched. And another one is called PO5F1. Uh, PO5 this is also called OCT1. And that's another very important transcription factor that is very well known to interact with NANOG and SOX2. These three work together to regulate a lot of important stem cell genes. And so you can see from motif, you can use it as a quality control. You can also use it to find what this factor is interacting with. And this is a standard analysis for all of chip After you get a peak, you do motif analysis, okay? And uh, as we mentioned, because uh, you know, if you find a, a, a 
a motif for T, say you do a chip seek for TF1 and you do motif finding, you found the motif for TF2. Is, is TF2 necessarily the, the right one? For example, you see, we, we, we see a SOX2, SOX4, SOX11, SOX10. All of them have the same motif, have good enrich, motif enrichment. Which SOX is the right one? Because we, we mentioned for motif analysis, you will find the family, you know, because uh, SOX2, SOX4, SOX10, SOX11, they are all the same transcription factor family. They all have the same motif. Just because you found the motif doesn't mean that is the correct collaborator. You have to also figure out among the different members which ones are the correct family members. Do you know how to do, how to narrow, narrow down which one it is? Um, you ask, in my cell of interest, is this transcription factor, like SOX2, SOX4, SOX10, SOX11, or actually you, want, you might want to try from SOX1 to SOX100 to ask which one is highly expressed in your cell of interest. Okay, and also say if people are doing this in tumors, uh, say they do this in prostate cancer, uh, you have one transcription factor that's estrogen, uh, androgen receptor and you ask, uh, you see some motif enriched, you ask out of the, you know, from you know, SOX or HOX, from the first member to the last member in the family, which ones are correlated with your family of interest, your, your, your factor of interest. Um, I would say most of the time this would give you some hint because you know, if these two have, it, it's like a guilt by association. If these two have to interact, you will see them hanging out together in most of the individuals, or most of the cells or tissues or, or tumors, okay? Yeah, so just from motif analysis, it will give you some hint. You also need to use expression data to really narrow down whether this is the correct collaborator of your factor of interest. Of course, later on, you tell your collaborator, uh, they will have to do some experiment to validate, but hopefully with this, you will narrow down to maybe two instead of a family of 12, okay? That, that's to, to look for the collaborating factor. And in fact, we mentioned that when the human genome was sequenced, uh, initially computational biologists had a bet of, of how many genes there are in the human genome. And they were very disappointed to find out there were not too many more genes in human compared to the fly. And this is because for the same genes, human has figured out a way to regulate them in a much more fine-grained way by you know, the level of protein and also the combination of the regulation, which means you very often have you know, a combination lock, TF1, TF2, TF3, TF4, interacting with each other in very different ways to regulate the downstream gene in a much more uh, tight way. Okay, and so TF regulation is very important. Um, and so the next part, maybe we should uh, restart the recording.